how much would you pay to have someone help you for an hour? The answer might depend on how much help you need, how wealthy you are, and of course if you're at one of those many points in history where unpaid servile labour was the norm. Well, since the early days of D&D, there's been another way to get help around the house or the workplace, an unseen servant. This spell fundamentally alters the way that magical folks see labour and has some very significant world-building implications. So let's discuss the huge outsized impact of this first level D&D spell on labour dynamics in fictional worlds. First, we'll start with what the spell actually does. Unseen Servant creates an invisible, mindless, shapeless force that performs simple tasks at your command until the spell's end, which is in about an hour's time. It has a strength of two, can't attack, and has one singular hit point. You can command it to interact with an object and move 15 feet with each bonus action, and it can perform simple tasks that a human servant can do, such as fetching things, cleaning, mending, folding clothes, lighting fires, serving food, and pouring wine. Once you've commanded it, it completes the task to the best of its ability, but it can't be more than 60 feet from you at any time. So, like many things in D&D, this all comes down to interpretation. By the strictest possible reading of the spell, the Unseen Servant can only interact with one object every roughly six seconds, which makes many of these tasks difficult. How is it going to mend fabric if it can only interact with either the needle, thread, or cloth being repaired at one time? As such, I would argue that as long as the task is in the remit of a human servant and could be achieved with the strength of a crab, bat, raven or rat, it is reasonable to assume that an unseen servant can attempt tasks at the level of a regular human servant. At this point, you might be thinking, well, this is just a tool for lazy wizards who would do anything to avoid interacting with people. But Unseen Servant is also a ritual spell, meaning it can be cast an unlimited amount of times by many spellcasting classes, as long as they spend 10 minutes focusing on it. And there's no limit on how many servants can exist at once. So a level one wizard working on ritually casting this for say eight hours can theoretically conjure up 48 hours worth of work in just that time. Maybe more if he deigns to use any of his spell slots too. This level of efficiency saving is comparable to the introduction of the industrial loom, which helped kickstart the entire industrial revolution in Britain. But what are these unseen servants actually going to do for 48 hours of working time? Well, the first answer is to clean things systematically, with the bard or wizard acting as kind of a housekeeper, butler style house manager, moving around with them as they clean. So, what, a single spell reduces servant staff in a household sixfold? Probably more expensive to have a dedicated spellcaster, though. So how could this spell transform labour in a fantasy world if having less house staff actually costs you more by hiring a wizard, although it's always smart to hire a spellcaster if you can anyway? Let's look to some tasks that are better suited for Unseen Servants. Now, Unseen Servants can't perform farming or mining labour. Their strength is way too low, but they certainly can work as organisers, administrators, paper pushers, filers, and other kind of simple 
office-y jobs. I would rule that unseen servants can, for example, organize documents alphabetically if given appropriate instruction in order to recognize relevant shapes of letters. I would expect that they could count coins by making a simple tally or using an abacus, again, with detailed enough instruction. As long as aids such as the tally or the abacus exist to automate the thinking parts of a task, then the mindless unseen servant can indeed follow basic protocols. It won't be fast, but it will be fully focused work with no chance of error. Speaking of organization, a really critical job in Middle Ages Europe and many other prior historical contexts too was as a scribe. Scribes were often multi-talented administrators, calculators, project managers, especially in ancient Egypt. But by the 12th century, scriptoria were beginning to come into full force in their use in Europe. These were usually communities of monks who spent painstaking multi-hour days copying out texts that were in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. Copying a Bible usually took about 15 months, and they were expected to be making one mistake per page due to distraction or tiredness. Unseen servants don't get distracted or tired. But you might be thinking, you can't copy a language you don't know, even with the master text right in front of you, as these monks in Scriptoria often had. Well, the thing is, these monks were doing exactly that. Not all of them had the ability to read the languages that they were copying. Following the form of a squiggle on a page is a task that is certainly feasible for an untrained individual. Perhaps copies of texts created by unseen servants are low in quality and lacks that flair that an illuminated or illustrated script might have. But in a world where books are literally a path to power, that's still pretty good. This is without even mentioning the possibilities created by combining unseen servants with other innovations. Chinese woodblock printing, for example. Even the biggest stickler for the rules of D&D can't deny that if a master craftsman makes some printing blocks, an unseen servant can't cover it in ink and stamp it on paper. Pamphlets in their thousands can be printed overnight in this way, and it, all it requires is a single spellcaster to supervise the entire process. But so what? We can produce books, pamphlets and parchments a little easier and cheaper. Is the relative democratization of information gained through this valuable enough to actually change the world? In all fairness, probably. But the value of Unseen Servant increases exponentially the more sophisticated manufacturing and industrial processes become. Modern freight trains in the US are now staffed by maybe two people. But that's not always been the case, and passenger trains require far more staff even today. Heck, historically, working in a train's engine room was a dangerous and deeply unpleasant task. But what if we replace all of those people with just one spellcaster, watching some gauges and instructing unseen labourers from afar when exactly to stoke the engine. Suddenly, engine explosions are significantly less deadly, and even passenger services can be operated with minimal staffing. Along with super cool service trays carried along by invisible waiting staff. That's just that's just awesome. But we're only scratching the surface. I mentioned the industrial loom earlier, operated using punch cards and fed yarn by a machine attendant. Well, it turns out these machines were quite dangerous, prone to catching and crushing arms, fingers, and sometimes entire people. But if your machine attendants are magically constructed servants who are going to disappear after an hour anyway, why worry about the dangers? And then we see the assembly line. 
This is kind of the logical endpoint of the modern manufacturing process invented by car manufacturer Randall Olds in 1901. However, with unseen servants as labourers, I feel like this concept of the assembly line may come about a lot earlier. You see, there is a limit to these unseen servants' skills and competence. They cannot learn, they cannot improve, and they are incapable of achieving complex tasks. There's a simple solution. Give them easy enough instructions and put them in a row, passing along the product. And at the end of the line, a product has been made more complex than any of them could have individually managed. Sure, these items may be of a lower quality than a craftsman could make, and not even comparable to a master, but through this low-level mages can create physical objects out of natural resources, or even process raw materials. Of course, you don't see unseen servants out there chopping lumber, working the fields, or working in the mines, mostly because they aren't strong enough and partly because they're invisible. But if the animated skeletons in the mines and the golems in the fields are doing their jobs, which, well, they have no choice but to do their jobs, then enough material keeps flowing in for the basic crafting capabilities of an unseen workforce. Besides, this is already a thing in fantasy. I don't know why we're so insistent on the objects themselves being presented as magical. Like a broom that sweeps floors on its own, or tea pouring itself, dishes that pet themselves on the table. These could all be easily achieved by an unseen servant, not some magical silverware. All conducted by someone like Mickey Mouse in Fantasia. Although technically, as a sorcerer's apprentice, Mickey shouldn't have access to unseen servant. Okay, but what are the consequences of all of this? Well, in the real industrial revolution and the creation of mass manufacture, we see some interesting things happening. People buy these less good quality tools that take much less time to make and buy them with their own money. The concept of personal ownership, therefore, comes to the fore as people are no longer working for their lords using the tools that the lord owns, but instead having their own capacity to purchase and having serious purchasing power and, crucially, the ability to build personal wealth. These are all massively important developments that might happen quickly in this sort of world. But there are negatives too, to the um, elimination of much of the sapient workforce. If necromancy and golemancy are used as described, the production process of goods is completely out of the hands of regular folks entirely. They may be relegated to being supervisors, or perhaps forced into training as wizards to get more unseen servants, or you know, doing other more difficult crafts that cannot be achieved by unseen servants alone. Alternatively, if golemancy and necromancy aren't in use, it's much easier to pass unseen servants off as animated objects instead. After all, these new looms look like they're powered by magic alone, with no visible need for any supervision at all. Or perhaps the entire factory is haunted by ghosts. Thankfully, the local lord has brought in a mage to, to work at removing the ghosts, but it's all the mage can do to keep them at bay from running over the rest of the town, who are rightfully terrified, of course. Ah oh well, at least these ghosts who are invisibly maintaining machines at the orders of the mage, perhaps, are keeping up the good work that the people used to do. Declare a few public holidays and push this narrative enough, and unseen servants have quickly become part of the culture. After all, people may be desperately unwilling to sabotage production if they think there's ghosts and hauntings involved, or if they think that their ancestors have returned from the grave to do the work for them. But every time I have discussed the replacement of labour with magic, there has always been, rightfully, discussion in the comments about the displaced workers and their fate. Never has this been a more apparent point than with this particular topic, where unseen servants are literally competing using human-like skills. So, 
I read a fair few economics papers about technological unemployment. It turns out there's a big debate among academics about whether we actually can and do see significant destruction of jobs when new labour-saving technology is developed. Some argue that the market tends to correct, with new jobs and new types of labour coming to the fore. As opposed to 200 years ago, for example, 90% of jobs in the US are in the service sector now. They suggest that the market compensates, given enough time. On the other hand, people like Marx suggest that as technologies change, they become more profitable for manufacturers and owners than they are for workers. And as such, labour-saving devices creates more profit from fewer jobs. Now, I'm not qualified or brave enough to land on one side or the other, as clear examples do exist of both cases throughout human history. But it is at least clear that the more efficient and autonomous a process becomes, the fewer people are needed to be employed to do it. Whether that results in reduced working hours, social reform, shared labour, mass unemployment, or you know, the springing up of an entirely new industry, it is really quite hard, if not impossible, to predict. It can be all of the above at once. What I will say, though, is that these things depend on many factors and hit some groups harder than others. For example, with cotton spinning, one of the first labour-saving technological revolutions in the 18th century Britain, the British workforce in this industry shrank nearly eightfold in 70 years. Not because we needed less yarn to be spun, but because with new spinning technology it was so much more efficient. Not everyone lost their jobs. Many people continued in this new styled industry, but this new styled industry was strangely geographically concentrated. Spinning relocated from the women's rooms in regular houses to large spinning workshops and factories largely centred in a few counties in the centre of the country. Before this, spinning was a traditional women's and children's profession in Britain, and afterwards there were not significant labour opportunities for many rural women outside production centres to find employment in the old job with the new system. The home-based industry practically died, and many women found themselves with less crafting to do during the winter months, as industrial lace and cotton were spun much faster than they could even manage, and women's labour shifted further towards child-rearing, homemaking, and education. All of these knock-on effects just because of a few developments in how spinning could be made more efficient. This is just one example, but I hope it demonstrates how closely tied into culture, geography and politics all of this can be, and demonstrates how underrepresented, underreported or forgotten minorities are quite often the earliest and hardest hit by significant changes in labour. So what does all this mean for Unseen Servant? Well, it will have deleterious effects in a high enough magic world on most servant labour as well as lower skilled, not strength based work. These are, at least in our world's history, often associated with traditionally female work roles in the home. Even our spinning example from earlier, which would certainly be replaced by unseen servants if it could be, would see mostly independent women working over winter replaced by a cadre of invisible magical things. Realistically, women would still work the fields and do all sorts of hard back-breaking labour as they have done throughout all of history, but in a D&D world which in my opinion implies a high magic setting, housework and winter work will be some of the first victims of unseen servants use. But then again, perhaps these displaced women workers spend their winters studying magic instead, creating a class of female mages. Uh, after all, 
magic textbooks are cheaper and more available than ever thanks to unseen servant scriptoriums. And let's be entirely honest, a Luddite rebellion led by technologically unemployed housewives sounds really quite fun to put in a world, especially if they're wielding magic. In any case, considering the human cost of things like this is tough, and there's no economic or historical consensus on how exactly any given new technology will definitely affect people. So I suppose do what feels reasonable and on theme for your world. But I hope you've enjoyed this deep dive into one of D&D's many spells with big implications. If you'd like me to discuss a specific spell in future, please do let me know. And really, thank you all so much for bringing the channel to over 20,000 subscribers. It's ridiculous, overwhelming and, and heartwarming to see all of the love and all of the fair criticism that I've been getting as well. Thanks everyone, each one of you, if you've left a comment, like, any of the good stuff. I appreciate you. But with all that said, I've been Tom, otherwise known as the Grungeon Master. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.